Welcome to Shares from the American College of Financial Services, where money meets minds. Here's a look at what we'll be sharing with you today. 2030 is six years away where women are going to control two thirds of the nation's wealth. Companies, if they want to keep women, if they want to engage women, if they want to have women not walk out the door, they have to change the way they're working with women. Welcome to Shares. I'm Lindsay Lewis, and I am this week's host and the lead for the American College's Center for Women in Financial Services and the Next Gen Advisory Task Force. Alongside my co-leader and co-host today, Alana Phillips, and I am a FinServe ambassador and co-chair of the college's Next Gen Advisory Task Force as well, and we'll be your host for this episode on representation in financial services. We are joined today by Carrie Carbonero, an award-winning financial advisor, women and wealth expert, CFP board ambassador, author, and women's advocate, and is a leading influencer in the industry today. Carrie, welcome to the podcast, and thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. You are so welcome. I am so happy to be here with you two, Dynamic Duo. We're excited. Yeah, we are so excited. (laughs) Carrie is a little bit of a legend in financial services. I had the privilege to meet her in person last fall at Excel Represent, and we bonded over some shared lived experiences. And then Alana and I were able to meet you again in real life at the FA Mag Invest in Women event. And enough about our background of meeting you. We'd love to hear more about you. So Carrie, can you walk us through how you first became interested in financial services and specifically how you became such a champion for women in the profession? Sure. So it's interesting. My dad was um, a money man or a banker. So he spent his whole career at um, J.P. Morgan Chase. And my dad and I was the oldest of the of the children, and we bonded over money instead of over sports. And so, from a very young age, I knew everything about money. He took me to foreclosure auctions. We went to straight talk with the Dolans, which is definitely aging me because you guys don't even know who that is. I'm sure, um, but that was like in the '80s. Um, and we used to go to all these amazing, like money, money related things together. And I just honestly thought that everybody grew up knowing everything about money. And I remember when I got to college and I found out for the first time that nobody knew anything about money that, and I was like, a, a it was like an incredible thing that I actually would sit down with my friends and like write budgets with them and things like that. And so like in college, and I was like, let's find money for you. And then we would go through their, their budgets. And then I was like, I can't believe this is like a thing that people don't don't know. So I guess I always knew I was going to do something with money. I just didn't know that like being a CFP was actually a profession because you got to remember when I graduated college, it was very, it was a very young profession. So there was not that many people actually doing it for a living. So I, and also when I went to college, you couldn't even get a degree in financial planning. Like that's, is that unbelievable? Like that's how long ago it was. So to me, I always knew that this is what I wanted to do. I just didn't know I could actually do this for a living and get paid to do it. So the fact that I actually got here is amazing. And as far as why I've been an advocate for women. So I don't know if either of you guys have ever read that book called The One Thing. Have you guys ever read that book? Yeah. It's by um, Gary Keller. And so what's interesting is the, it, it follows your life and you figure out what's the theme in your life that keeps coming up and up and up and up again. And so what's interesting is, so I went back through my life and I said, okay, when I was in high school and, you know, elementary school or whatever, I would, I would have, I would teach uh, girls dancing and I would be like, I was captain of cheerleading and I did like stuff to help women. Then when I was in college, I did, I founded a sorority um, and I was founding president. And so I can make a safe place for women. Then when I got out of school, I wanted to work with women to make them financially literate so that I could make a safe place for women. And then it just kept running throughout my life. And so it pretty much is the theme of my life and why I get out of bed in the morning is because I want to make this world a better place for women. And it's just incredibly important to me. I, I, I think it's what I was put on this earth to do. And so that's why I've been able to do it. I love that. Yeah. I want to shout out the a couple things in what you shared, Carrie, because 
your data being willing to teach you those things and let you participate in the money conversations, I think sounds like um, abnormal compared to the experience of your peers, at least, and just what an impression dads have, especially for women in our industry. When we look at some of those trends, they have so much um, power and influence over the way that we learn and show up in the world. And I know my dad's a roofer, so I thought I was going to be a roofing contractor when I grew up. But like he let me use power tools and and um, do the same things that the boys were doing. And that really helped um, shift something in my mind that I know not everybody got the experience of that. I think that's so awesome your dad gave that experience to you. Thank you. I, I and, and unfortunately, he passed in 2005. So, you know, but I always feel like he's with me and through me and seeing, you know, and he's like my angel for me. So he's at least seeing it. And I'm, I'm people say that they see him in me all the time. So, yeah, you've seen a lot of stuff then. Um, if you've been in the industry that long and, and teaching people from such a young age, um, that making a safe place for women, I think, Lynn's you and I very much that resonates with the things that we do in the industry. Can you comment a little on how maybe the landscape of the industry has changed for women since you've had the perspective of seeing it over the years? Um, so it hasn't changed hardly at all. And I am very, very sad to say that. But it is the truth. I've been in the industry for a long time and it's still not where it needs to be. You know, we're still, it's, you know, male dominated. It's been male dominated. It's always been male dominated, you know, and the numbers are, you know, we were 5%, 10%, then 20%. And now we're like maybe 24. So as far as percentage wise, and out of those numbers, you know, it's not that all these women are the, excuse my language, the kick-ass breadwinners, um, you know, you've got people working in support staff, people working in operations, people working in teaching, and there's nothing wrong with any of those positions, but the real money comes with the rainmaking. Yep. And so out of those numbers, the 24% are not rainmakers. So that is really a travesty right now in the industry. And again, it's because the industry is not female friendly and it does not lend for, for women to be um, accepted and do it their way. And so there's so much that needs to be changed there. Um, that unfortunately there's, you know, one of the things I'll say is that the CFP board has the center for financial planning, which is their nonprofit arm. And one of the things they came up with is you need to, you need to see it to be it. And so that's one thing that they're doing is highlighting women and highlighting so that this is a career, this is a choice, this is, you know, scholarships associated with it. Um, at least that is happening. But again, it's taking, it takes a long time to move the needle. But if you do nothing, you get nothing. So you have to start somewhere. I love so much of that experience. And the, if you can see it, you can be it. We love to say, if you can see her, you can be her. And so being that her, and you really are that her for me. So I love that we're having this conversation today with your track record and all of your different experiences. You've led large teams, divisions, you name it of successful financial professionals. And so one thing that I would love to get your feedback on is how you can lead women in those prospective groups and how have you found success recruiting women into the industry? So again, very difficult. This is not this is not a simple answer, and nobody I think has the the answer yet. I think it's a work in progress. Um, unfortunately, if you're going to be a woman in financial services, and it's like it in a lot of male dominated professions, it's not just financial services, but you have to be stronger, you have to be better, you have to be more confident than all the men. So you already have all of that against you coming in. So which is so complicated, and then. You also have the language, the fact that the industry is not female friendly, the language is not female friendly, the experience is not female friendly, it was built by men for men. So that all of that has to change. And I've been trying to make a change. I said, I feel like some days that I'm pushing a rock up a hill and it just keeps falling back on me. Um, and it's so incredibly frustrating because when I feel like I'm making progress and then I feel like it's I'm, I'm going backwards again. But 
then I'm going to keep trying to make that progress. So I definitely do not have all the answers on this. And I think all of us collectively coming together can solve this. And also the fact that women are the next wave of uh, wealth in, in wealth in financial management. So, so the McKinsey study says women are the face of wealth. In, and which everybody knows it's coming. 2030 is happening. 2030 is six years away where women are going to control two thirds of the nation's wealth. Guess what? It has got to change by then or before then. But again, I've been saying this for 10 years and it hasn't. So it's incredibly frustrating, but it is really going to change. There's no, no way because companies, if they want to keep women, if they want to, you know, engage women, if they want to have women not walk out the door, they have to change the way they're working with women. The language, the process, the experience, the whole entire system needs to be changed. There is so much stuff I know we feel like uh, I can see has not changed yet, right? And it really feels like we're at that tipping point there. And I think about and want your perspective on, like Lindsay and I were at you know, the FA Mag event that you were at as well. And, and I think about even just in my career, I've been in the industry for eight years, at the beginning of that, there's no way that I was wearing hot pink uh, or business shorts or sparkles and feathers like I think Lindsay and I show up to things with now that that I have to believe. It's funny. I have sparkles and feathers on. Sparkles and feathers. I know. I know. So I have to believe like you have made change, right? Because I saw you wearing the sparkles and feather, it gave me that confidence to show up the next time that I was at a conference uh, a little more authentically and a little sparklier than I had before. Like we are the women who are here, right? Because I don't think we've increased the number, but I think we have changed in many ways the way that we show up and interact with each other. Can Will that be contagious? Is that, you know, pushing towards this larger change within all of our firms? I truly hope so. And you know, it's interesting because the Invest in Women conference that we all just came from is so such an incredible experience. I mean, that is where, I mean, and that's been going on for, for it's gonna be 10 years next year. So yeah. it's just a, an incredible conference of incredible women. And I mean, the momentum is there. Let me tell you, if you did not go to that conference, you need to go to that conference because it was incredible and it's going to continue to be incredible. And things like that are moving the needle and they're going to continue to move the needle. And we also have to help each other. We have to help each other because we cannot do this alone. That's why we need female advocates and we need to help. I need to help you. I need to help the next generation. Um, and ironically, I didn't have anybody helping me, but that's okay. I'm okay with that because I was early on. Yeah, we appreciate you trailblazing for us, for sure. I love that thought process of helping the next generation and this next cohort of women. And so what advice would you have for women who are navigating the complexities of balancing career ambitions, family, long-term planning, hopping into the industry? Like you've done it all. So what advice do you have? Well, no, I, I definitely have not because I, I, have, I did not have children. So that's the whole, the whole balancing act, right? I am in absolute awe. I will bow to moms who are doing it. And I mean, I just don't know how you do it, Lindsay. I don't know how you do it. And I am in absolute awe of anybody who does the work mom balance. It is absolutely incredible. I, I, unfortunately, I married Mr. Wrong in my 30s. So I didn't have children. And then I married Mr. Wright in my 40s and I was, it was too late. And so I always say I'm childless by choice. However, I am a stepmom and a grandma. So I don't, it's not like I don't have children in my life and I have a million uh, nieces and nephews and I'm the, I'm the best aunt in the world. I actually just bought Tay-Tay tickets for my, for my niece. So I know, big deal. I, I volunteer to be your you too, Carrie, if you need another. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I don't know. I cannot answer on the balance part. That's the one thing where I definitely fall short. Um, and also I was single focused on career and helping my clients and moving the needle forward. And I just couldn't, I couldn't do it all. And I know people can, I just, I wasn't one of them. So that's the first, my first thought on that. Second thing is on balancing for long-term care and like retirement and things like that. Every woman needs to take care of their own finances, no matter what. So, I mean, I practice what I preach. 
So I always put away a minimum of 10% of what I made a year. And at some points in my life, I've put away 50% of what I made a year. I know it's totally crazy. Early adopter of the fire method, right? <laughs> yes. You know what it was? It was that I was so worried about being a bag lady and running out of money that I could never save enough and invest enough. So it's my own fear that got me to that point. And so I know that other women have this fear too. And, and it's irrational. It's literally an irrational fear. I had my therapist call me the Gucci bag lady because he's like, there's no way you're running out of money with all the money you have and the, and you're carrying designer bags. You're not going to be a bag lady. You're like have Chanel's and Gucci's. And I'm like, whatever. So anyway, it was kind of funny. So it's a real thing. I mean, even though it's not real, the fear, the fear is real, even if it's irrational. The American College of Financial Services, championing causes, connecting communities, delivering best in class applied financial knowledge and education for the benefit of professionals like you and for the benefit of society. Expand, Expand your opportunities, opportunities at the all new theamericancollege.edu. I appreciate, um, Carrie, the, the can't do it all sort of thought here because I also don't have children and I look at Lynn's and other women that I work with in this industry of like, gosh, I'm losing my mind, you know, without having that extra responsibility um, uh, that I, I don't know how you balance it all. I had a, a mentor, um, Celeste Gurley, who's an incredible woman and, and powerhouse that I look at in my career. And she had said to me at one point, you can't do it all, right? Like she was a mom. She was a managing director. She was the only woman in that leadership position within the, the Lincoln financial system. And she just said to me in the course of, you know, talking about my career, you can't do it all. And so you do have to make those concessions and choices around what is a priority today and, and shifting when those different hats that you have to wear are a priority. And I thought that was really powerful advice. Can you talk a little bit about the industry, these firms, as we think about that idea and how they can best support women with whichever hat they're prioritizing right now? What are some of those initiatives or changes that might make our industry look like a more inclusive place for women? For starters, the language, I, I wrote a piece um, for Rethinking 65 called, Where Are the Women? And it talked about how we use male measuring sticks and AUM and all these things about that are so incredibly, and GDC and you know all that ridiculousness which is so anti-female. And, you know, we want to know how many clients have you affected? How many households have you, have you uh, helped in your life? How many women have you gotten to retirement? How many women can sleep at night because of you? That is a better measurement than what's your GDC or what's your AUM? And then not only that, I, I mean, I hate that term AUM because you don't even know, like, what, what if they're charging five basis points or zero basis points, but they've got big AUM? Well, how about what's your revenue? I think that's, that's, a, that's a, better, a better measurement. Yeah. Why don't we look at more interesting metrics? <laughs> you want to find out what I make? To ask me what my revenue is. Don't ask me what my AUM is, right? But, and, then, and then not to mention the fact, and this is, I, this, I feel really strongly about this. I've had a lot of men say to me, especially when I was first starting out, your AUM is not high enough based on who you are. And I'm like, excuse me? Oh, you could be doing so much better. And I'm like, okay, so what, what does that mean? It's so incredibly derogatory. And also, so it's harder for women to get AUM than it is for men. I don't know if you know that. Like, in, literally, it is harder. I've had women say to me, women say to me, I'd rather work with a man. They can take care of me better than a woman. Oh, dear. No way. So you've got unconscious bias from men and unconscious bias from women. How much harder does our job have to be? It is hard. So anyway, the fact that we are showing up every day and working on this. And then also, they do say that women do like to work with other women. They just can't find them. And I'm like, we're here. You just have to look for us. 
Absolutely. We're like setting the stage. We're here. We're ready. This is the one thing I love about you as well, Carrie, is that you not only are an advocate, but you've walked the walk and you have a book of business and you've, you know, built maybe not assets under management, but you've helped a lot of people. And recently you're in the news quite a bit writing a number of really exceptional articles. I really enjoyed the FA Mag article, the eMoney Advisor article, the City Wire, all of those. And just like in your presentation at the Invest in Women conference, you started sharing quite a bit about the changing demographic of clients, but especially the rise of female breadwinners. And so I'd love to get a little bit more technical here as we talk about kind of the rise and the changes that you've seen and the landscape adjustments for these female breadwinners. Yes. Well, it's so exciting. It's a very exciting shift. Um, and it's part of the wealth transfer. It's part of what's happening in 2030. Right. That's what's that's what's really driving it on, on top of everything else. So what's so exciting to me too, when they when I was given the topic of female breadwinners um, as a as a, for invest in women, I said, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna research the history of female breadwinners. And when I started to research the history, it didn't exist. And so I literally had to write it. And I was like, I cannot believe there is no history of female breadwinners. So I went back and I, I'm a history major undergrad. So I like, like this stuff a lot. And so I went back to the, to the thirties and the forties and how far we've come. So in the thirties and the forties, when women were working and got married and they were teachers, which by the way, was an incredibly female um, profession, they lost their jobs because there was a, a law on the books that said, if you're married and you're a teacher, you lose your job. Can you believe that? I mean, it's literally unbelievable. So that's where we, and then, then you go to the fifties where there was no female breadwinners other than um, single women and widowed women. Um, Cause there was, and then in the, in the fifties, females were supposed to be there to serve the men. Like that is literally their job. Their job was to make sure everything's good at home, be, look pretty, uh, make the house clean, keep the kids quiet, you know, make sure you have dinner on the table, make sure you don't ask him too many questions because he had a hard day. I mean, I, I, it's just literally incredible what, where we've come from. And now here we are today, we've got Taylor Swift, we've got Beyonce, we've got the Barbie movie, you know, this is incredibly positive female role models. I mean, just, just incredible. And so not to mention, so now the numbers are that we're at 40%. So we went from, you know, zero in the 30s and 40s, other than like, you know, little tiny, tiny numbers to now we're at 40%. Now 40% includes single women, divorced and widowed women, if they're working, you know, a lot of widowed, widowed women might be now, you know, n not going back into the workforce because hopefully they have life insurance and or and or they're older and they might already be retired. And then you've got the real female breadwinners who were actually the female breadwinners in a couple relationship. And so what's happening with that is that's going to going to be a majority. So once that hits, and that's the tipping point we were talking about earlier, once it hits that women are now the primary breadwinners in the United States, 51% or more, everything has to change, which means it's got to be around 2030 or sooner and guess what? Now you're not going to have a male advisor coming in and ignoring the female because she's the breadwinner. So everything is going to change when it comes to our industry. And I cannot wait because it's, it's happening now. It's just too slow for my taste. <laughs> that was a great history, Carrie. And I think about uh, there, there's got to be some place and lens. I'm just thinking about, I don't know, the women's center or something where we could put that history. Cause I also think about, and my knowledge of this is not a, uh, I'm not a history buff, but the um, black women who we we know of in history that were the first millionaires that had started these businesses that were um, paving the way there, right? Because there's there's uh, certainly, I, I think a lot of our conversation ends up being centered around white feminism, right? right? And there's so many of those incredible stories within other populations of folks as well that it'd be cool if we had a more central sort of place to to tell those stories. But 
Um, I think about that female breadwinner, Carrie, and that's been my role in relationships. And it, it's an awkward one sometimes, right? Because people do assume, um, oh, you bought a house, you bought that together. Well, you know, no, we did not. But will advisors, the male advisors, actually change the way that they talk to women who are coming with that power dynamic in their relationship or money dynamic in their relationship? And what are some of the other things that maybe we need to change or do to better serve that female breadwinner? So it's so interesting because, um, you know, there is the power dynamic of, you know, who makes more money is usually has more power in the relationship or unless it's 50, 50 equal. And that's amazing. Um, it's a very interesting dynamic. Do you know those people, Carrie? Do we? <laughs> well, actually, I think I'm pretty close to that. I have, I have a, I have a great relationship with my husband and I'm the breadwinner and he's retired. So, um, it's, it's, I, de I definitely think we're equal, but you know, it's taken us a long time to get to this point. Although it's, it's something that you have to work at, you know, it's, it's definitely not an easy thing, but he's super comfortable and super supportive. And, and what's interesting is, since we've been together, I just went on a straight lineup. And it's because I have had him there to support me, which is incredible because you think about that, you know, and I, I said that at the, at the presentation that strong women scare weak men. And you need a strong man to be with a female breadwinner. I mean, and it's funny because I, I have a lot of clients who are like that and it's, and the men are fantastic and fantastically supportive and support her role to be who she is and to have her keep climbing, which is really incredible. Um, but how can we change? First of all, that man, if he does not change his language, he's going to lose that person as a client. There's no way that a woman is going to, a female breadwinner is going to put up with playing second class citizen in that, in that meeting or even um, unconscious bias coming out. Like there's no way that a woman's going to accept that. So they're going to have, they're going to lose, the, they're going to lose the client. So, but what's interesting is I have, I have this um, quiz that I use. It's actually from Kathleen Kingsbury and it is how female friendly is your practice. And it's a quiz and you can take the quiz and see like, there's things, honestly, most people don't even, I mean, obviously I'm at a hundred, so I'm incredibly female friendly, but like I've given it to men and they're like, oh, I thought I was good, but I guess I'm not. So they don't know what they don't know. They don't even know. So I feel like that is going to just going to keep happening. Like there's so much, I think I believe that, I, and, and it's funny because I, you know, I call myself a women in wealth expert and so are you guys. But what's interesting is I feel like every single um, wealth management firm is going to have somebody like that to tell them what they're doing wrong and to tell them, you know, do the training, do the teaching, do the coaching, do the changing of the language, do the changing of the experience. All of that's going to happen. I mean, I'm planning to hopefully do this um, full time for the rest of my life because there, I, I feel like it's needed so much in the industry. But it's not there now. It doesn't even exist. Nobody, th this position doesn't exist. And it's funny when I was getting ready to leave Goldman and I was pitching everybody on, on this idea, everybody saw it, thought it sounded great, but nobody took me up on it. <laughs> nobody wanted to actually follow through with it. It sounds so great and there's a business case for it, but we're going to wait. We're going to wait till it actually happens. Yeah. It's always that like anticipation sometime in the future, like someone else's problems. Um, what's really interesting, and I love this concept of this pulse check and understanding our conscious and unconscious bias. There's a great research report by Merrill Lynch where they look at the eye um, contact during a client meeting. So regardless if the advisor is male, female, non-binary, if they're working with a hetero couple, they spend 60% of their eye contact on the man versus on the woman, right? And so it's this unconscious bias that's happening along the path. And so I love this quiz and how you scored so female friendly. I'm curious if you have some advice for our listeners around understanding the preferences of female clients, especially as it relates to maybe investments or risk management or, you know, 
questions not to ask or understanding people are childless by choice. So what is some advice that you have towards female preferences? Yes. So what's interesting with women is women in general are more conservative than men. Conservative in terms of like their investment risk tolerance profile, not in terms of politics. Yes, correct. Yeah, nothing to do with politics. I, I never talk politics. <laughs> yes, can, in investments. And so it, what's interesting is, is they hate to lose money more than men. I, I guarantee you, if you did some sort of study, which has not been done yet, but if you did a study, you would find that women feel the pain more than men feel the pain when it comes to loss. And so it's just, it's in our nature because women want to hold on so much more to the money than the men do. And, and it's so much harder for them to get it and save it and invest it and all of that stuff. So that's the first thing. Second thing is that, you know, the language is also, again, very male focused. So, you know, and all the analogies related to finance are very male focused. So um, I wrote a piece on um, the invest in um, on the asset classes and I compared asset classes to shoes. And it was, you know, it's very, very female friendly, obviously. And every time a woman reads it, they send me a message and say, I finally get it. I finally understand what you're talking about. I never understood this. I never understood it. It didn't make sense to me. This is language that I can understand. So I feel like every single part of the process of what we do in wealth management needs to be changed. The language and the analogies and the whole thing needs to be female friendly. So we shouldn't just use golf for everything, <laughs> Carrie. That's not the appropriate analogy for everything. <laughs> or baseball or football. Hey, I like baseball, but yeah, the golf and football analogies run rampant. <laughs> you know, I also just got back from the shift conference, you know, and that's about, you know, behavioral finance. For, and, you know, that's also very female friendly because, you know, women want to talk about their feelings and how they feel about money and what money means to them and all that stuff. So, and that's called human first financial guidance that, you know, that's that shift, which is also the shift to women. So it's, it's kind of a double shift. So all of that's happening too at the same time. So women like that. We want to talk about what money, what 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 it feels like, what it what it what our money scripts are, what our money personality is. That's super female friendly. Um, and so if you're not using behavioral finance, then you're also missing another piece for women. I think that's such a full circle moment of how you've been able to normalize the money conversations and the relatability and the analogies that you're using. Um, one thing that I found really interesting, there's this book called Women of the Ticker, and it goes through the history of Wall Street and the women on Wall Street. And a lot of the belief systems in risk and associations with certain um, like asset classes stem from like the late 1700s and have been passed down generationally. So a lot of the women might be more, quote unquote, conservative from a risk tolerance perspective, but it is a learned behavior because that's how their mom did it and their grandma did it. And like, if you go all the way back generationally, and I think we have, we're at the perfect moment of changing that narrative and that money script and what an actionable piece for the financial professionals who are listening. Also, this has flown by and we are about to wrap up. So in the close, uh, Carrie, is there any last words of wisdom that you would want to leave with our listeners before we let you run? The other thing I was going to say that I like to tell women to make them feel more comfortable is, you know, there's never been a 10 year period in the market where you've lost money, where anybody's lost money if they were in a balanced portfolio. So we, I always kind of go back out to history and I like look at decades and decades and things like that versus, um, and then I always tell them because they're like, oh, my such and such friend lost all their money. And I'm like, not possible. And so I always say the only way you can lose all your money in the market is if you're in a single stock that goes bankrupt or you're in a Ponzi scheme. And if you're working with me, neither of those things are going to happen. So I feel like if we can get over the fear for women and they can take the long term view, that's where they're going to be able to build the wealth and not be as fearful. We love breaking down the barriers of fear and that education, I think, that comes around that being in the context or a language that we relate to makes such a huge difference and makes it more approachable. So, um, Carrie, thank you. I think this is all great advice and experience and um, knowledge you were able to share with us. How do our listeners find you? I'm super easy to find because I'm the only Carrie Carbonaro on the planet. So if you spell my name right, um, 
Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram. I'm on X, although only once in a while. And I just got a TikTok account, but I'm not really on that too much, but I am on there. So you can find me anywhere. Well, thank you so much for coming. And we're so excited for our listeners to build up their financial acumen as they work with female clients and female breadwinners. Thank you so much, Carrie. Yay. We told you that was going to be so much fun. That was so much fun. That's all for now. But you can find all our episodes on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and most other streaming services. Be sure to like us, follow us, and leave us a rating and review. Shares is a production of the American College of Financial Services, and we hope you join us next time as we share ideas that expand your opportunities.